Good afternoon, and welcome to the University of Pittsburgh European Studies Center's Conversations on Europe. Today's topic is Black Lives Matter, the movement in Europe. I'm Alison Delnor, the interim director, and um, I just want to thank first uh, our colleagues who are joining us from our partner centers, the EU Center in um, Florida International University, a Jean Monnet EU Center of Excellence, as well as in the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I thank you for helping to make this possible. I also thank the room full of people who came here from the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm looking forward to um, an engaging and exciting conversation. Um, to do that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Professor Waverly Duff, who teaches in the Department of Sociology here at the University of Pittsburgh. Professor Duff is an urban ethnographer whose research examines inequality, including race, class, health, and age, and gender, and culture and ethnography. His recent book, No Way Out, Precarious Living in the Shadow of Poverty and Drug Dealing, is from University of Chicago Press in 2015, and it challenges popular misconceptions of urban ghettos and explores how neighborhood residents make sense of their lives within the severe constraints as they choose among unrewarding prospects. I'm very pleased that he has agreed to moderate our panel today. And so um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> how the setup is going to go, I'm going to introduce our esteemed speakers. And then I'm going to kick it off with um, two sort of starter questions. Um, first, I want to introduce Toye Nabetu, is the founder of Legali, a pan-African human rights organization that challenges the misrepresentation of African people, culture, and history in the British media. He is primarily responsible for producing progressive media and education programs that actively work for pan-African self-determination, social political freedom, physical health, and spiritual wealth. Um, Dr. Kende Andrews is an associate professor of sociology at Birmingham City University in the School of Social Science. In 2013, Kinde produced, uh, published his first book, Resisting Racism, Race, Inequality, and the Black Supplementary School Movement. He is now the director for the Center of Critical Social Research and the founder of the Organizations of Black Unity and co-chair of the Black Studies Association. Um, here at University of Pittsburgh, Felix Germain is an assistant professor of Africana Studies. Uh, Dr. Felix Germain specialized in transnational and cultural history with an emphasis on France, the Caribbean, West Africa, and the United States. His work centers around topics such as race relations, colonization, decolonization, post-colonial migration, and labor relations, as well as black social movements and gender relations in Africa and the African diaspora. Um, how I would like to kick this off, um, given that we're talking about Black Lives Matter Europe, um, I was wondering if our um, panelists could say something about what is unique about Black Lives Matter in the European context, as well as some of the goals. Um, and a follow-up question, um, how is the current political climate in the US and in Europe shaped Black Lives Matter? And particularly, I'm talking about the rise of Le Pen in France, Brexit in, um, in the UK. Um, and the rise of Trump in the US. So those are some questions that I think could kick off. So the first question, how is Black Lives Matter unique in the European context? You should kick it. Sure. Um, okay, cool. I first would like to um, put the, the notion of Black Lives Matter in a historical context um, because this is not the first Black Lives Matter in, um, in, in France, at least. Um, blackness in France is, first of all, it's a very complex uh, phenomenon. Uh, blackness in France is, in many ways, I would say, the, um, the illegitimate, illegitimate uh, child of French colonization. Right? Uh, because of French colonization, um, you have all of these black bodies in France who are not necessarily um, wanted in France. Um, so when did this happen? When did, it, you know, when did they come? Uh, under what circumstances? Um, really, the 1960s, late 50s, 1960s, um, this is when um, you have the first working class post-colonial black migration to Paris. Mostly people of, um, West African and Caribbean origin. Um, 
and there were many social movements during that time essentially focusing around housing access to decent housing focusing for jobs better jobs um housing jobs and um to be recognized as human beings not as colonial subjects you have to remember that um in the late 50s turn of the 60s the french still referred to uh people of african descent as sometimes indigene right which is a pejorative term that means uh it's almost it's almost like below a negro right it's almost like savage um and so they fought to be um as seen and valued as human beings uh, so that's i think that's the first black lives Matter. there's a long history of uh fighting um um to establish black identity um uh, in france I don't know if should I keep on going or do whatever you like. And well, I can I can build on that if you want. Oh, I don't know. Continue. I didn't realize. So like, continue. Okay, cool. Um, so that's this. That's the sixties, um, um, sixties and seventies. But these were not black French people. These were African folks and Caribbean folks. Uh, trying to settle um, in France, uh, and it was a black France, a very fragmented black, black France, not like you know the uh, an African American United States. The idea that people here have a common black folks have a, a common common linked fate. That was a fragmented black France. In fact, very fragmented. There were fragmentation among African folks, uh, and it's clearly the Caribbean folks did not want to have anything with African people. 1980s was a turning point. Um, it was like a new generation of black identities in France. All of these people, all of these black migrants, you know, who came to France, of course, they they you know, they, they had children, um, and that new um, wave of this new identity, these, these people, these black folks born in France, were now saying, hey, you know, we, we are facing, we are encountering racism. Uh, and we are protesting against racism. One of the first person to do that was Arlen Desir. Um, Arlen Desir, who started a movement uh, in the early 80s, uh, anti-racist movement, which was supported, which was in many ways like a multicultural movement. Um, and as as uh, the number of Black French people increased. Uh, the number of social movements uh, to claim a space in France, to claim French citizenship. Uh, no, movements are saying, hey, we are French. We deserve the same rights, the same attributes as white French people. Uh, we are citizens of France. We are not Senegalese. We don't know anything about Senegal or Martinique or Guadeloupe. We are black French people. Um, as we progress through time, we witness many more movements claiming for citizenship. Up until recently, the, uh, um, the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, movement, which already had a precedent in France. Uh, I think four years ago, uh, there was a movement created. Um, the name of it, it, this movement is translated roughly in, in English, Be Careful Our Police Kills. Um, it was a movement, you know, generated uh, to combat and to generate awareness about police brutality um done towards uh, people of african descent sub-saharan african descent uh, caribbean descent and especially north african descent we pass the baton to a colleague somewhere somewhere else <laughs> um well I, i'd like to say that there was a synergy in what's happening in the uk with what's happened in france um very much so so can you hear me okay yes cool okay so very much in the sense that there's been a long history of uh, of resistance to police brutality. I mean, we see them in uprisings in, in Brixton, in, in Birmingham, in different regions. But when we talk about Black Lives Matter specifically, I mean, there's a movement called the United Friends and Family uh, Campaign. And that's essentially a, a, an annual a group of families that have been uh, terrorized 
by police brutality in their families and they go and they go every year as a ritual go to Downing Street and they organize continuously so Black Lives Matter or the concept of Black Lives Matter isn't something that's new to the UK but what is new is the way that it came over and how it attracted young people into it because the Fen United Friends and Family Mo Movement is uh, it, I mean I'm a pan-Africanist so you won't hear me use the word black or white. I'll talk about Africans, Europeans, Asians. I don't do any color coding. What's happened is that the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw it over here from America as quite one simple straight message, which was resistance against police brutality against African-Americans. It's a very simple mandate. But the problem over here, and this is the challenge that we're facing over here, is that, first of all, uh, the UK government, the media are terrified of the idea of the Black Lives Matter movement, as in the US, being imported into the UK. So we've faced a tremendous amount of resistance, negative propaganda, uh, arguments saying, well, the UK police don't run around with guns. So, you know, you might end up with a broken leg or, you know, smashed in skull or in a coma, but you're not going to lose your life by someone shooting you dead. These are facetious arguments. What happens very much so is, like I said, deaths in custody is a long-term uh, problem. Uh, deaths uh, by tasers, deaths of people in uh, who, who are being uh, uh, restrained because of mental health issues is, is, is another issue. But because of the media hostility to the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and its attempt to stop it gathering foothold in the UK, what's happened by some sectors of the Black Lives Matter movement, and there were quite a few. I mean, I, I'm familiar with the London uh, group, which is a, is, a, is a London version of Black Lives Matter, but it's also an official Nottingham chapter, which I'm also familiar with the founders of that. Uh, one of the things that we kind of find out with that is that some of the groups have a feeling that Perhaps what we need to do, because we don't have a constant stream of police brutality leading to fatalities, then what we need to do is widen the remit. And I think that's in some ways a mistake. Uh, it doesn't mean that the issues that are being widened, as such as immigration, because that's now asylum seekers, uh, detention, doesn't mean that that's not related to the Black Lives Matter message. But what attracted young people to Black Lives Matter was the clear injustice, can't breathe. It was, it was the Oscar, you know, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was all uh, um, Sandra Bland. It was, I mean, I don't want to go through all the names, but it was all those cases that we saw reflected in the news over here that we could map on to not as many instances in the UK but certainly to some instances in the UK. So I'd say that's where the slight difference comes along, that Black Lives Matter in the UK has become very much a politically black movement, which deals with any injustice by the police or by the state's representations uh, against African and other minority groups. Whereas in America, it still seems to have the edge that it's dealing with police brutality of African Americans. Um, yeah, and I'll just, I guess, add to that in, that what it's really interesting because because Black Lives Matter does capture younger people. You know, we had three thousand people in Birmingham, and it was majority people don't really see on the scene coming out for the first time. And you understand that it's it's partly because literally they're just reacting to the American stuff, right? So when you see Philando Castle bleeding to death, you see you see those pictures. You know, if you talk about Pan Africanism and that connection across the, the ocean, people feel we really feel that. It's not like that's an American thing, that's our thing. So people are coming out partly just because that's our thing, that's our brothers and sisters, but they're also understanding that if you're black, you are three times more likely to be killed in suspicious circumstances by the police, four times more likely to be in prison, up to 26 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police and arrested. So you, it's, it's on the one hand, it's just like, there's this thing happened in America and we feel solidarity for it. On the other hand, it's actually, this does relate directly to our experience. Um, but Brother Tony is perfectly 100% right that that part of the movement's been lost. Because Black Lives Matter is very much, when it emerges a, a few months ago in Philando Castle killing, it really is grassroots, it really is young people, it really is getting capturing the youth in a way that I've seen movements before have not captured the young people. And it's, I guess it's drifted away from that quite quickly. And you don't see that same mobilization. So that's, that's one of the, the issues for Black Lives Matter in, in the UK particularly. How do you, how do you keep that going? And how do you keep that pressure going? Because it has it has changed and it become something else yeah. really too quickly. I'm actually, I, I know I had proposed a, a second question, but now I want to sort of um, 
push back a little in asking that so in the u s. context, um the three founders who are black american women um and the focus was largely in addition to policing, but also issues related to immigration prison reform um reproductive health environmental justice issues um can you all speak to one how the police violence component becomes a defining feature but also these other areas of black lives matter um within the various contexts so is it beyond policing is it environmental issues is it questioning prisons and how prisons are run um how prisoners are treated um do is there room for um reproductive and gender issues what are some of the other issues for the local chapters of black lives not local but the european chapters of black lives matter um in addition to policing so something about policing but other parts of the movement okay um, i mean sorry oh, i mean brother kind of kind of uh, I can talk for advocacy, and this will shut me up sometimes, okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> Brother Klein that kind of dealt with it quite well, with what I was saying on, on, on how it's captured the young people. And you're talking about these, these different strands, and they're all present in the UK. But in many ways, what's starting to happen over here, I don't know what's happening in the States, is that those strands are recognised, but they're, they're almost diluting the strength of the movement because what you're having is other organizations, well-intentioned uh, organizations like socialist worker and people with different agendas coming into the Black Lives Matter and seeing the seeds of almost like a civil rights movement, a new version of a civil rights movement. And Black Lives Matter, which caught over here in the UK at least, basically on that narrow premise of police brutality that's the one that gets your emotional heart tugs going when you see young girls being dragged from a pool when you, i mean that's the thing that draws you to it when it starts to widen them we, we recently had a, a shutdown event in the uk against climate change and that was placed under the black lives matter uk uh, uh, banner and even though the issues that were addressed were very valid what happened is that it kind of starts to siphon off support for the core movement because people start to think well hold on are we dealing with climate change? Are we dealing with, with, with refugees? Are we dealing with uh, reproduction rights? What is this movement now? Is it trying to be a, a catch-all for every type of injustice that exists? Because then it can go on infinitely trying to find all the problems. And so I think there's a recognition that anybody who's African and belongs to different, uh, have multiple identities. So someone who's uh, who, who identifies as, as as trans or someone who identifies as, uh, I'm just trying to think of all the different kind of identities that people have. But all these different identities, as long as they're still African, they're still included in the movement. But there is an internal struggle, as in, thus do we therefore start saying that Black Lives Matter and start championing these other causes and dilute the main strength of the message. Because we're seeing in the UK, or I would argue we're seeing in the UK, a kind of dissipation like what happened with the Occupy movement. With the Occupy movement, you know, massive explosion. We are the 99%, but there were no single demands. It was kind of like, we are the 99%. And then what happened, that massive explosion happened across the world, and then it slowly petted out. That's what's happening in the UK, but that's a deliberate attempt by the state to mute it. And we kind of contribute to that by not having a narrow focus. Not Sometimes we like using a sledgehammer to deal with all the issues as opposed to having a scalpel to say, you know what, Black Lives Matter supports environmental rights. We'll campaign with Greenpeace. Black Lives Matter supports, you know, other organizations. But Black Lives Matter as a movement, I can only talk about the UK context, is focused on deaths in custody, police brutality, stop and search. These are the kind of areas in the UK where we have issues with that kind of thinking. And I, and I think uh, one of the differences, you look at America and look at the UK, at the end of the day, even in America, so Black Lives Matter in the US, it very much is about the police issue for, for a while, right? And it develops, it goes around the police issue. Uh, Black Lives Matter really isn't one movement, it's different organizations who come under an umbrella of Black Lives Matter. And, and originally the, the thing that pushes it is against police violence. And then when you develop that and you develop those connections and develop those networks, then you're able to have a solid base to say, well, actually, yeah, let's talk about environmental justice. Let's talk about something else. Yeah. But in the UK, we haven't done that. And actually, generally speaking, in the UK, uh, black organizations are not in general as developed as they are in America. So what you have is you've come with Black Lives Matter, 
that's captured people. And what you, what we needed to do was to say, well, let's use that as a platform to build those links and build those connections. And then when you've got a solid base, that then allows you to talk about environmental justice, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just come in straight away and you change it to this and you move into that and you go into this, it just puts people off. And that's, that's been the biggest impression I've got over the last few months, is that the urgency and the young people and the grassroots connections and the movement, I mean, 3,000 people in Birmingham, I think it's 4,000 in London, 3,000 in Manchester. We haven't seen those kind of numbers for a long time, but very quickly, those numbers have disappeared and it's, and it's, and it's become value. So I think thinking about strategically what does Black Lives Matter do in, in Europe really needs to, to focus on building those connections and into a movement because at the minute it, it really isn't one. I think. Um. I want to um, think about uh, Trump, Donald Trump, and the, uh, the reaction to, uh, to the Trump election, still connected to your question, you know, um, to uh, the, uh, the Trump election in, in France, and the um, overseas French department, Martinique, right, Luke, French Guiana. Uh, there's no other way to put it. Uh, the reaction was, Mead. <laughs> <laughs> That has no translate. We don't. You understand? Like, darn it for now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that, was, that was really it. Um, why that reaction? Also, it is because of what's going on in, uh, in France. Uh, because um, they are saying, well, if Trump is elected with such political discourse in the United States, well, what does it say for us with uh, Marine Le Pen, with the far right movement, right? Um, I'm saying this because. The French people of African descent in France are also, you know, also dealing with these uh, political movements, um, they, and they have, you know, and, and, do, and dealing with this political movement, they have created organizations uh, to address your question, dealing with um, immigration issues, environmental issues, uh, police issues, uh, citizenship issues. This, it's there and it's been there for a long time. Um, we don't hear about them so much in the US. However, whatever happens in the US, you know, usually has an echo somewhere else in the world. Um, and Black Lives Matter, in many ways, has an echo in Paris. Um, it was something that a lot of the, the youth, particularly the youth from the suburbs, could identify with. Um, and certainly, um, and in some Pan-African ways, uh, they also sort of um, organize uh, uh, a, a, a movement. Um, but I think they insist to make sure that it is not a copy of the um, of the American movement, African American movement. Um, it is distinctively French, uh, and it's not something new. You know, it's. Uh, in many ways, uh, protest against police brutality, which has already been there, uh, and is somewhat entangled with other issues of citizenship, belonging to the nations, uh, labor, and, and, and immigration as well. So, um, which brings me to the, the originally proposed second question. Um, as someone on the outside looking in, I, I look at the rise of Trump, I look at Brexit, I look at um, Le Pen rise in France. Um, how how is this shaping or influencing Black Lives Matter across Europe? Well, I think actually I think that one of the good things you can take out of the rise of Trump or and the right in general is that it kind of shows the society as it really is, right? America's not more racist today than it was two weeks ago. It's exactly the same amount of racism. Now we yeah. just have a better understanding of the races. Right? And it was the same it was the same with Britain. I mean, Brexit in the UK, when we voted for Brexit, you always, it was like this outpouring of this overt racism, and people talk about it like it's new. It, was, it never went anywhere. That's been the experience of what's happened institutionally for the last 100 years in the UK, right? So I think that one of the, the silver linings you can pick out of this shift to the right is that it then emboldens the movements more, right? Because now it's very obvious with Brexit, with Trump, with Le Pen coming in France, very obvious that you need to have these movements. You know, people aren't deluded anymore to think that we're making progress, you've got a black president, etc., etc., etc. The realities of the racist system we live in are very open and bare for people to see. 
And this is already in terms of discourse, you can see um, people are talking about racism again, people are talking about activism, people are, people are really supporting the idea of these movements in a way that, that without this research, you probably don't get. Nobody now is really questioning whether you need a Black Lives Matter, whether you need movements of racial justice, yeah. because at least now it, it's blatantly obvious, right? Yeah, it's, it, that's a, a superb response, and I, I, you know, I can't even top on that. I mean, with uh, the Brexit situation, I mean, I mean, there was a Im the way it was sold in the UK was an anti-immigration movement, but it was also uh, an, an a sovereign a sovereignty issue. So one of the things that people don't realise is that because Britain was part of the EU, they had to hold on to European Convention of Human Rights. They had to adhere to it. And what was happening every every few months, they were getting slapped down. They were, you know, they were stamping down on stopping search. They were stamping down on protesters. Uh, the, the home, well, the current prime minister, Theresa May, was forced to do a consultation on stopping search, and it really annoyed them. They didn't want to. They didn't have any interest in dealing with the aggression against African people in the UK. But what happened? The EU, because their membership meant that they had to adhere to the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, they had to. By pulling out, what's happening over here is that we we're, we're living in a time where you have a nation that's actually saying we want to repeal the human rights bill that's the britain we want to repeal it and replace it with a british bill of rights so you've got to really check what that means you know we're living in a nation that wants to repeal human rights so nothing's really changed i mean i can take this all the way back to enslavement nothing's really really changed on that, on that issue america again for us what we're seeing over there with the rights of, of trumpism is this really an honest face on white supremacist beliefs uh, I'm not saying, obviously, that the people, everyone in America is a white supremacist, but what I'm saying is sufficient numbers of white supremacists and people who had no interest in racial equality or social justice, that they were emboldened enough to vote. And the threat that African people face over here in Europe and over there in the States is not from the Trumps. It's not from the Tories. It's not from those figureheads that we get a choice every four years if that's your the limit of your political engagement in, in, in democracy. The threat comes from the people, the millions that voted for them. Because even if Trump goes away, even if he, he modifies his behavior, even it doesn't matter what he does, we now know that there are millions that supported his rise. And in the UK and across Europe, it's the same thing. We're talking about Le Pen, Across the EU, uh, EU, EU, there's this rise in these fascist movement, this anti-immigrant uh, settlement. So Black Lives Matter lives inside this kind of toxic environment. And like Brother Kind, they were saying, whereas before there was a very strong argument saying, well, no, you know, we, we're not, our police aren't as fuckish as those in America. You know, we don't need to have that. When Brexit happened, there was a vast increase in attacks, racial attacks across the UK. So people are starting to recognise that there is a need for a movement that addresses these issues. The problem is, of course, is that this movement has always been exist in existence. This new identity, which we've taken from America and in, you know, imported and transported on top of existing movements, is having its own struggles because, like we say, there's all these different competing forces. But this is the situation that we live in right now. This is the, this is the challenge that Black Lives Matter has. And I, I hope that the movement continues to grow, but history tells us quite clearly that even if Black Lives Matter decides to, to, to it, it fizzles out in a fad, there will be another replacement because the, the, the underlying issue hasn't been resolved. And the communities, the people that are involved in them, those who, who really want this return to this regressive state, uh, they're still out there. Um, I think, so, uh, how do these movements are related to, or connected to Le Pen and so forth? Um, we can think of um, various organizations, uh, minori so-called minority organizations, such as uh, CRAN. CRAN, it's, uh, it's a black organization that is an umbrella for many black organizations, right? Um, they are, they are made, so, so there are a lot of, quote unquote minority organizations and um, it's sort of th th there's a tension between them and the discourse coming from the right and the far right and the tension is you know essentially they're saying um, we should stop blaming uh, black bodies for issues of criminality 
uh, unemployment and and and, and uh, for, for 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 having problems. Uh, but uh, we need to understand the connection between the relationship between uh, discrimination, racism, uh, access to resources, and and the suburbs and those neighborhoods where you don't have. You know, you have to travel miles and miles to to have a good job. To um, we need to question uh, so um, anti-black the relationship between anti-black racism, access to resources, um, and um, this general feeling that they don't belong uh, to France. Uh, and so it's 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 that kind of uh, discourse that uh, that you have two debates. On the one hand, you have um, the far right saying, well, it's are these people inherently incompatible with the French Republic? Are these people, um, are they, do they have inherent, are their problems inherent? Do they have inherent problems? Inherent uh, tendency to be, to be criminals. And on the other side, you know, these um, quote unquote minority organizations that have been there for more than, for decades sometimes are saying, hey, no, you, look, you need to look at uh, the connection between uh, Take into account, you know, anti-black racism, access to resources, and so this, this constant notion that we are not at home. Um, and also, before I, just, I, add, I just add into this: like, in Britain, we're getting very smug, right? You know, Trump has been elected. Isn't that terrible? But Theresa May is far worse than Donald Trump. I mean, Theresa May is actually still cheap. I mean, if you actually, if you actually look at the policies that Theresa May has, she was Home Secretary. Okay. He's included sending vans around London that told people to go home. She was also <laughs> the Home Secretary who, who, who basically said, we're not going to support saving drowning Africans in the Mediterranean Sea because if you send, if you send boats out to save them, that's just going to encourage more people to come. So basically, yeah. you let, let Africans are free to die in the Mediterranean to stop other Africans coming. Right? This is one of the most right-wing fascist leaders we've had in the United Kingdom, and she's far more dangerous than Trump, or even Le Pen, because we don't really associate her with with her fascism, right? We kind of give her a pass. She seems more credible. She's kind of, but really, we actually look at the policies she's pursued, particularly the policies on immigration. They are more far right than anything Trump or even Le Pen is suggesting. Honestly. Um, this uh, before I open up to the different audience members. Given that there are Black Lives, Black Lives Matter chapters in Canada, different parts of the US, Caribbean, South America, various countries in Africa and Europe, where is the room or is there room for coalition building amongst these different Black Lives chapters around the world? And what are some goals that we all can unite around in terms of challenging political power and oppression? Uh, that's a tricky question, that one is. Um... I know I sound like a scratch record. I, I would say that the first focus is actually having a commitment to actually understanding and supporting the message of the title, Black Lives Matter. I mean, you might say African Lives Matter, but actually recognizing that that in itself, just that one simple phrase, is actually a legitimate organizing rally cry around. All the other issues are, are valid, but I think that you see, every organization, no matter where they are, have to localize their concern. They have to localize how they express Black Lives Matter. That's what's happening, really. Because Black Lives Matter is actually on the European or the Western radar, what happens, it becomes a vehicle for other grievances. So because there's so much media attention to what's happening in the States, the label comes over here and existing, pre-existing organizations use it. I'm sure the same things in France, in Canada, no matter where it is, because the media focus is there and it can help attract new members, people go to it. But how do they start drawing links within each other? I think there has to be a commitment to say, what are the, the top three goals that we're going to deal with and limit uh, uh, the stretch outside that. Be comfortable just talking about these issues. I mean, I'll, I'll use your Trump example. Uh, one of the things that happened with Trump, which was quite interesting, and you know, was that you know he starts off with all this uh, anti-Mexican rhetoric, um, and then you know there was quite a bit of a fuss about that. Uh, and then he goes on to this whole thing about you know uh, uh, um, uh, you know building this wall. That's this, this continuation of, of this anti-Islamophobic kind of thing, as well as the anti-Mexican thing. There's a little bit of fuss about that. The moment he actually was then exposed talking about women and his, his misogynist 
tra uh, 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 like traits came out and they were exposed for the world to see, the, the media disproportionately placed far more effort in denouncing that and made the message very clear to every minority who, who, who I mean, I'm not saying obviously there are women who are minorities, but every minority group that hold on. The issue that we're concerned about more than anything is not Islamophobia, not racism, but misogyny, because we are included in that. And what happens when you're a minority and you see the media response in that way is that the only way you as an organization can ride on someone that's wrong, be the rider, reach the rider audience, is by then dealing with his misogynist issues. It's the same thing like the Black Lives Matter movement. What happens is that the number one interest for wider audiences that aren't personally affected by the other issues that affect, like housing, like education, like you know, you know, social care, like incarceration, all these other issues. The one issue that a major really focus on is the sexy, glamorous police brutality on a video camera, because then everyone can say how bad it is. So I think that sometimes the movements will have to be sophisticated to say, well, okay. This is what gets the media focus, and right now we're trying to grow not just a, a, an international movement, but a global movement. And so therefore, we have to be strong enough to say that that is our core focus. And we, we mustn't, I'm not saying we don't deviate from that, but we have to recognise that the policies that we work around are focused on that. And that is in itself a worthy uh, a mission to have. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I'd say is um, actually, like, so historically, the diaspora connections of the politics, I mean, they exist, they go back. They, 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 they have more history than something like Black Lives Matter. If you look at Pan-Africanism, if you look at Garveyism, Ethiopianism, and Malcolm X spends the, the last good part of his life traveling the African continent as in, and is in Birmingham nine days before he dies, right? Um, and there's been historically really strong links from different parts of the diaspora. Uh, even thinking here in Birmingham, my, my dad tells stories about when like Zimbabwean freedom fighters would come to come through Birmingham and African Americans would come through Birmingham, Caribbeans, and you had these kind of almost not almost seamless links between the movements and the struggles and liberation here and liberation abroad. But that's become trickier now because since '65 or so, that kind of period with racial relations legislation, you know, we have started to become incorporated into Western into Western countries. You know, so I have a very good job in a university which 50 years ago, no chance I would ever would have had, right? And so because we have become incorporated in, we still experience racism, we still second-class citizen status, but because we've been incorporated in, now in a sense we're, we're more part of these societies than we were previously. So when Marcus Garvey, 100 years ago, is building the Universal Negro Improvement Association and manages to get 5 million members across 52 countries, and we wonder why, why is that possible? Part of the reason is because everybody knew they weren't welcome. And like, well, obviously we're not welcome because we got, we're not part of this, right? But now we have become incorporated to an extent and now we're part of it. We're actually arguing for different things. So if we're arguing for incorporation to the British project, well, guess what? The British project is what oppresses our African brothers and sisters on the continent. So if what I'm arguing for is to get more in this, in this country, I'm actually arguing for less for my brothers and sisters on the African continent. And this is a really big problem because how do we deal with that? issue how do we deal with issues that for example black lives matter the main you know the main tool of it is it's a smartphone right well how does a smartphone exist a smartphone exists with mineral which is children in mines in places like congo and tanzania are, are taking it, right? we only have these smartphones only have the technology for black lives matter because of the super exploitation which happens on the african continent so this is a problem we have to deal with we talk about the diaspora actually many issues our interests particularly with the African continent and the third world, are no longer aligned the way that you are. So how do we overcome that barrier? So I don't know, how you, I don't know what the answer is, but that's a question. I'm always going to do. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, you. You raise a very important point. Um, um, I think the issue of Black Lives Matter is really pertinent to uh, Western democracies. Because what do the, essentially, what, is, what does it show? It shows that Western democracies are sort of full of paradoxes, right? Uh, and the ways in which people of African uh, people of African descent are treated is a perfect example of that paradox. And so we can do something about it. We can create uh, commonalities between, you know, institutions and governments, UK, France, and the United States, Germany. Fine, okay. But then, um, how do you factor in uh, rest avec? 
and this equation, right? The rest of it of Haiti. Uh, rest of it and Haiti are, you know, children um, slave labor. It's, it's like slave labor in, in Haiti. Uh, so it's, and their notion of blackness is totally different also. They are, maybe they don't consider themselves black, they consider themselves Haitian, you know. Um, so uh, we, we, we have to be careful as to not romanticize blackness also, uh, to sort of see how it is uh, socially constructed uh, and how it's relevant to part, to, specul uh, to spe specific spaces and nations. Uh, the, the challenges are very different when you, uh, as you mentioned, when you grew in a, uh, in a global south. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, I'm going to open this up to the. Oh. You, uh, I just wanted to steal oh, the first sure. question. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're going to open it up, can I? Because it, it kind of pertains to what um, you just said, Felix. But I'm curious in thinking about the the term black, and as it's especially as it's imported by countries where English isn't the first language. So in, in France and Germany, about which groups are being included under that umbrella? I mean, is there is there a sort of separate Burr Lives Matter for North African groups in France, or is the is the Black Lives Matter encompassing it under the full umbrella? Similarly, other cat, other groups of people who may be excluded from categories of whiteness in the UK, you know, South Asian, are they being included in the umbrella of Black Lives Matter? Well, they certainly are included, but again, it's not the most important. Mm -hmm. Addressing issues of police brutality in France, you know, the one that I mentioned, uh, attention la police to uh, be careful uh, uh, the police kills. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a movement that encompasses people of North African descent, people of Caribbean and West African descent. Um, so it's sort of the movement of minoritized mm -hmm. people, um, and so um, uh, we can. Sure, there is the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I think, my personal opinion, it, it is um, it is a sort of on the moment, you know, movement. Uh, I don't. I think it's ephemeral. I'm not sure it's, if it's going to last. Um, but certainly, what will last is, you know, uh, the voice of people of African descent, North African descent, you know, to um, like not to, to make sure that the, the nation really understand their plight and their efforts to become full French citizens. I think we we also have to be careful that we don't get caught up in a semantics game. I mean, I'm a Pan-Africanist and we're notorious for dealing with linguistic mm -hmm. issues. And I'm aware that I'm part of that living contradiction. But I think it's like, when we ask those kind of questions, it's almost like saying, uh, do trans women, uh, are, they, are they welcome inside the feminist movement? Can they come to women only meetings? And then once we start going down that minefield, uh, what happens is that the, the movements themselves tend to implode with arguments that are very academic, but not based on real life issues. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, I don't use the word black, but I can say in context that it's being created as Black Lives Matter. Every region is going to localize it. So if there's a Black Lives Matter inside a, a North African country, then they will have their own definition of what they see as Black Lives Matter. If it's inside, uh, 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 you know, London, there'll be a definition. But I think the, the point that uh, Brother kind of spoke about, which was very much about a globalization. Well, I mean, he didn't use that word, but that's what it really was. Was the issue is that if we are honest with ourselves, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we are still, because we're consuming Western media, seeing it through a Western mindset, we're not talking about uh, officers who are killing uh, the young African boys in Nigeria, for example. We're not talking about, I had a friend who came back from Trinidad and uh, some of the, the shootings that are happening there. We're not discussing all of these kind of issues. So if we're talking about a, a, a force, a, a way to glue things together. It's been very clear that this is dealing with those particular issues, not just here, but over there, and we support every movement wherever it is. How they render the way that they deal with their authorities is always going to be down to a local issue. I would never come to America and, and, and then you know, sort of like assume that I could tell the activists on the ground what tactics work best to deal with law uh, enforcement over there. Likewise, a Black Lives Matter campaigner from the States couldn't come to the UK and tell us how to deal with a metropolitan police force. So we have to recognise that there's an issue of localisation with the problem, but it's also an issue of localisation with 
people who are part of the movement and how they're going to actually render that issue. And that's the start. We've got to be very mindful of who's black, who's not, who's black enough, who's not black enough. What does the movement do? These are the kind of things that have fragmented and destroyed very powerful uh, movements from the beginning. And I think, I'm, I'm a person who believes in collaborative uh, work, I believe there is an ample space for different groups with different agendas, as long as they're working under the umbrella of a theme, to collaborate in their different ways and take care of their individual constituents in moving things forward. Uh, and I, I think that, Anthony, I think one of the, if you look at why is, why is it about Black Lives Matter resonates in Europe, and particularly in, in the UK, why is it that, you know, thousands, over 10,000 people, young people, young black people particularly, come out on the street for this issue which happens, you know, 3,000 miles away, is what they're being drawn to really is, I mean, I call it blackness, Toy, uh, Brother Toyin calls it African, we, we can debate the semantics of it, but what they, are, what they are drawn to is this idea of diaspora, the African diaspora, the idea there is a politics in the diaspora, the idea that we are connected as a diaspora. That is so essential to the movement behind Black Lives Matter that, you know, one of the problems you see in the UK, so in the UK they say political blackness, this is one of the things which will ferment it 100%, because those same people that are drawn to African diaspora, they ain't drawn to that. That the idea of political blackness, yeah. everybody, they are very much drawn to African diaspora politics. That's not to say that you can't then build coalitions, but it very much is one of the, the most attractive things that young people in, in the UK is they're seeing African diaspora blackness, this connection that's speaking to all of us. Uh, and when you when you then start to add in, it just don't work. And actually, number one thing that will make it not work in the UK context is that. I would, say. I would like to add also just uh, as a. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was walking the streets of Pittsburgh by the university with my very bland sweater. Uh, and I um, came across a older, really an older white man with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. You know, I thought it was really cool. Uh, but I also think that we also need to mention that, you know, those are not sort of um, racially pure, you know, if you we know race is a social construction, but you know those are you know those are multicultural and multiracial movements, and a lot of people of European descent also participate. Um, and uh, anti-police brutality movements, Black Lives Matter movements in France, uh, um, and and various types of social movements. You know, and I think also in the United States too. But and you know, sorry, and just to add again to that, I think that issue of of blackness, if you like, of that connection is important because if you look at so uh, Brother Toy mentioned the United Friends of Family, and actually there's been lots of campaigns about police brutality. One of the things which hasn't captured the attention of young people in the UK is because it is, you know, it's a multiracial coalition. They don't talk about race as much. It is because, you know, white people get killed by police, Asian people get killed by police. And so if you look at what's different to that and what's different to something like Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter highlights race. Black Lives Matter highlights blackness. Black Lives Matter connects you into that diaspora in the way those other movements don't. And actually, that is one of the main driving forces that brings out those young people. Not to say that you don't want to talk about the issue more generally, of course you do. But if you look at why it's successful and why it hits the heart of people, it really is that connection to the aspect, which in the UK context as well over the last few years has probably disappeared a little bit. And so Black Lives Matter has given a space to something that people can connect into. So I think that's really important. And then building on top of that, um... There's an issue about the support. There's nothing wrong with it being like a multicultural, a multiple ethnic support system. Uh, but it, it makes me think about the recent, uh, a few months ago, there was a, a, a protest called a Day of Rage, which took place in East London, which is where I live. And uh, I went there with my daughter. And the demographics of the people there, there were maybe around five, 600 people there. The, the demographics of the people there, it was around, I don't know, 70% European, 20% Asian, and 10% African. And what happened was because of that composition, so there was massive support for these injustices. And it's cool. It's great that you have that massive amount of support for injustices. And no one's going to argue with that. But because what's happening was that there was this imbalance in, in ethnicity, the discussions that were happening were very kumbayaish, and I don't mean to be kind of facetious. They were very all over the place. And then what happened was that slowly but surely, the 10% of African people who had come there for this so-called day of rage started to move out. And then what happened, I remember we was there with my daughter, she was saying, Daddy, what's going on? I thought it's the Black Lives Matter thing. And she's been watching it on the news with me. She wanted to get involved. And what happened was that there was a march. They decided, well, we're going to march on this park. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have a, a make an action. 
And then what happened? They marched out of the park and we thought, okay, well, let's see what happens. Maybe there's going to be some occupying of, of police stations and stuff like that. They got around a few hundred meters and there was a Starbucks. The march stopped. Now I'm saying that what happened is that different groups have different competing uh, 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 priorities. And I'm, I know it sounds a little bit facetious, but this is what happened. I went home with my daughter. A group of us started chatting on the way home about what went wrong, why it didn't work. Everybody had a great time. It was a carnival, it was a lot of photos, a lot of uh, 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 you know narcissistic photos on Facebook. But what happens when those kind of things happen? When support that comes outside the minority group that's actually being targeted becomes bigger or becomes more dominant and doesn't work in as in supporting but tries to lead the movement is that the movement then starts to fracture away it'll be the same thing like uh, men joining uh, like i say i use a feminist example again feminist movements are mass and then starting telling the women what they need to do to empower themselves Something starts to break down when you get in that situation. There's a, there's, there's a requirement of humility in these kind of things. So if the movement is formed on a premise of dealing with police brutality or state repression and, and aggression against African bodies, then if that's what drew you to it, then respect that and follow that. And these are kind of issues. It's not about saying that the support can't be multiracial. France is slightly different because, of course, you have a high concentration of North Africans as well as West Africans. And so when those riots took place in 2005, what happened? You had two young boys, one of both ethnic groups, both African in that context, and that's what unified it. But the politics in the UK is very different. And I suspect that these are the these are the areas that are what's making it do it occupy when it's, it seems like it's starting to lose its energy, and you know, that, and that's a problem. So should we open up questions? Um, given that we had a question from Pittsburgh, um, <laughs> sorry, um, Florida or Florida in uh, Illinois, Urbana. Don't be scared, we don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question in Pittsburgh. Um, I don't know. Oh, okay. How about you? Oh, okay. I'm like, I got it. I guess I'm, my question is, is uh, what kind of uh, evidence of material kind of networking or links between Black Lives Matter organizations transnationally? Because you know, it's easy to see what's happening in the United States and then decide that you want to set up your own chapter. But I was wondering if you see evidence of people like, um, you know, organizing with uh, leadership across national boundaries or organizing with grassroots across uh, national boundaries. Um, yes. So, uh, so yeah, in the UK, there's certainly been some crossover. So, Patricia, Color, uh, Patricia Colors came to Birmingham and did a talk tour around uh, the UK last year. You had a few people have gone back and forth as well. Actually, the United Friends and Family campaign went to America uh, this last this year. Last year, this year I think it was a tour around America. So there has been there has been some connections, and there could probably be more and more with the grassroots. But again, this comes partly down to uh, Black Lives Matter in the UK, yeah. at least, has really consolidated itself as a thing. So it's difficult to have international connections when the national connections are really grounded. Thank you. Um, yeah. and, 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 and on that, and on, and on that, the same thing again, I, I think I mentioned before, uh, the Nottingham chapter uh, deals directly with the leadership, I mean, in, in, in the States. But the London chapter, in many ways, is kind of like an organic, uh, uh, unofficial chapter. And I remember going to a meeting, and there was quite an argument about it, because what's happened was that London chapter was told that it wasn't allowed to use a Black Lives Matter name, uh, because it didn't establish itself as an official chapter. And inside that meeting, one of the things that was coming up was that the group was, well, hold on, hold on. We've seen these images. We are supporting this movement. Um, we don't see the need for us to have some official status. That's not what it's about. You know, we are the ones who are going out there building websites, printing T-shirts, putting our bodies on the line. So what's happening is that there's two ways of connecting nationally. There's one that sees it like a, 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 almost like a spiritual movement. So the, the US version is the base. And what happens is that these satellites are coming. They're not directly linked. 
And there's another side which is actually dealing directly with the states. And actually, so you're getting, you know, like a, a instru- I would say instructions, but guidance from from up above. They're both valid, but we have to recognise that. And 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 that's where sometimes, depending on people's personal ideologies, that's where we start to get into trouble. Interesting. Uh, I think there is a, to your, it's a very good question. Um, there's a long history of transnational connection between um, the UK, France, and the United States. At least people of African descent are there. Uh, we can even think of um, the time of the Harlem Renaissance when uh, René Maran, uh, actually a, a French writer, influenced uh, John uh, Alan Locke. Um, writer of the New Negro, and we can think of um, the other the writers of the Harlem Renaissance who influenced the Negritude movement. Um, but very recently, that those transnational connections were even manifested in terms of uh, at, at, the, at the ground level. Uh, I'm thinking in 2005 when um, uh, after the riots that sort of decimated the Parisian banlieue, uh, we noticed the creation of CAN, this major black organization, which actually received funding from the uh, NW, NWCP. Um, so there is, you know, this connection. Now, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I think, you know, this the the the, 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 the protest against police brutality in France is so it's it's not new. Uh, there's been people who, who have been engaged in this matter for, for years. Uh, and so uh, we may see you know, various connections, uh, of course, um, but it's, it's already something that's really ingrained in the, in the, in the French Republic, I would say. Other questions? Yeah. The question I, I think here in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement is like a school for young people who are trying to connect to those previous struggles like you mentioned. Um, and a lot of people are reaching for uh, uh, the bigger struggle against the effects of colonization and slavery. And it's moving towards like a decolonization and a reparations type movement. I wondered if that's happening in Europe. I mean, here it's there's the beginnings of it, but I don't know if the same thing's taking place in Europe. I'll, I'll be brief here. Um, we, you have uh, movements for reparations, especially coming from people of, uh, of um, Caribbean descent, uh, and Guadeloupe, and Martinique, uh, and also in Paris, because there is a definite bridge between those those three spaces. Uh, so there is a vibrant, you know, uh, reparation movement that not, not only focuses on the, the French territories, but on the on Africa and the African diaspora. Um, and there are many, uh, you know, cultural, intellectual movements. Uh, um, recently in Guadeloupe, um, there was uh, the creation of uh, the Memorial Act, uh, which is a museum, sort of a museum uh, that uh, is about recognizing. Um, the um, the role of the transatlantic slave trade and Guadeloupe and the Caribbean region. So yes, these things are very much present. Um, yeah, and it makes sense if you think of um, European black populations. You know, tend to be directly from former colonies, so the Caribbean or the African continent. And so there's like real historical connections to decolonial movements. Um, historically, as I was saying before. Uh, Birmingham, you would see, in, where I live in the UK, you would see people from the African continent as, as likely to be speakers um, in the 60s, 70s, as people from the Caribbean or America. And you had these proper, this idea of a decolonization. De- de- I mean, actually, the Pan African Congress in the UK sent a delegation to the sixth Pan African Congress in Tanzania in 74. So there were real historical connections to this movement. Um, and they are still there, still very much there. Reparations movement in the UK is bigger than Black Lives Matter, if you like. There's this, this historical, there are these historical movements. So I guess the question of Black Lives Matter is, if you think Black, if you think of Black Lives Matter more of a, a way of bringing together existing movement organizations, how how does that work and how does that work? Um, and how, how can it connect, connect these things together a, a bit better? Or can it? I mean, maybe it doesn't work in that same way. I don't know.
other questions? I have a question. It's kind of generic, but um, sometimes I find on Facebook, unfortunately, unfortunately, I will post things, and I just want to know how to respond to someone that says all lives matter. How do you respond to someone that doesn't understand it? I, I, I would. No, no, brother. Actually, brother, kind is right. What happens when people say all lives matter or blue lives matter, and they start appropriating and misappropriating the term? When you start engaging in those kind of discussions, you're actually wasting valuable energy. If there's a chance that the term was actually being used from ignorance and that there's a possibility that having a, a reasonable discussion will actually lead to some kind of understanding, then fine. But the reality is that most times when people use that term, they're deliberately trying to be disruptive. And when you spend a lot of energy trying to engage with that, then all you're actually doing is actually not helping the movement that you actually want to help. So if someone says, yeah, all white lives matter or blah, 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 you don't need to engage with that. These are the distractions and tactics that have been used throughout time. And this is it, this is one of the things that, you know, it, it might you, but everyone's entitled to their view. That's what so-called living under liberal democracy is. You ha also have a choice as into where to place your energy and where they're best served. And uh, Malcolm talks about this quite quite well. I mean, uh, there's, you know, in his autobiography, there's a situation when uh, a, a European woman asked him, what can she do to help the movement? And at the time, you know, he said nothing. And then when he reflected, as he grew as an individual, he realized that actually that was a bad mistake. And he, and, and he fought on that. There's always something else you can do. And keeping that person in check or, or, or educating them when they are maliciously trying to derail you is not the best use of your time. Thank you. I, no problem. I have to say, uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's funny, like the people, when you start voicing your opinion, the people that kind of come out of the woodwork and kind of take you by, take you back and surprise you, the people, excuse me, the people that you didn't realize wouldn't kind of understand it or. So that's very good advice. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, one of my favorite things was, um, Brexit was the, was the perfect time to filter out their friends because they could see exactly who, who was commenting on what. And then you can just block them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to start doing it. But not to put yourself in a bubble where you don't have uh, other challenging views to your ideas because then you can't grow. But yes. <laughs> So it's, it's very rare that I'm um, interacting um, in two different um, countries and across states. So now I'm going to put pressure on some of our visitors in Florida and Illinois. Are there any questions from either of those two groups? What I suggest you do is get a pen, spin it, and whoever it stops pointing at, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Not one question. It's, it's okay to absorb and uh, no, you know and process information. That's what I'm good. You know, I'm actually comfortable with silence. <laughs> and now there are people who are leaving. <laughs> um, so um, before, I guess we could, um, we should wrap up. Or is there anything closing that um, any of you would like to say um, in regards to Black Lives Matter and moving forward in the future? Well, I would just say um, something I think... brief on that. Yeah. I would say that it's it's, um, it's 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 a movement that has already existed. That already exists in France in many ways under a different name. And that will continue to exist as long as um, you have systems uh, that are oppressing uh, certain peoples. That's, uh, that would be my ending statement. Okay. Uh, I mean, oh, sorry, going for No, not to you, not to you. I, I, I was just going to say that right now we're living in a time which is recognized by the UN as the international decade for people of African descent. So sometimes people need justification to focus on African issues.
um, well, you've got one, you've got a whole decade. And so we're talking about how to make the movement national or tra- you know, international, how, how we can get discussions uh, across the globe. I'm saying if you've got a United Nations mandate to actually celebrate African people and raise these issues, use that. So when people try to block progress, because, of course, Black Lives Matter, I don't know what's happening in the States, but in the UK, Black Lives Matter uh, has fallen out of grace with the media. So it's no longer on our screens. But this doesn't mean that police brutality isn't happening. So we have to maintain the focus ourselves. And I'm saying that using a vehicle like IDPAD or, you know, is, is an opportunity to keep this going, to keep it growing, to keep the focus very surgical. Because with Trump being elected, I can see very you know, it's quite obvious that what's going to happen is a discourse we focus on everything he does, if he sneezes the wrong way, if he coughs the wrong way. And that's not really anything new to a person who's, who's African. That doesn't make any difference. Even under Obama, um, the, the, the life chances of African-Americans, uh, uh, you know, we saw the Black Lives Matter came about. Uh, during uh, Obama's uh, uh, election, or during his, his, his time. So I think that that's what I would say. Use vehicles like United Nations Independent Decade uh, for African People, and uh, yeah, just stay focused, stay on track. Don't get distracted. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, Black Lives Matter is a, it's an opportunity, you know what I mean? I think the, the part of the question you think about Black Lives Matter is why, why now? Why, why now? Why? These issues of police brutality and mass incarceration aren't new issues. Uh, the issues of the African diaspora need to come together and organize are not new issues. I think if you look at the rise of the right, again, this is just going to make it very, very, very clear that these are not new issues. So I think I think the really important thing is to kind of Black Lives Matter has captured, captured young people in a way that other movements and organizations haven't been able to um, in this moment. So it's about really saying, well, there you've got an opportunity. There's obviously something there that needs to be, to be grasped. It's about how do we build on it and move together forward to make sure it is lasting and is sustainable because it's definitely necessary. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good time to close there. Um, Kende, um, Toyin, I hope our paths cross in the near future. This was an amazing experience and thank you as well, Felix. Um, hey, Florida. Urbana, uh, thank you all. This was a, a fruitful conversation. You know, thank you. 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 Th